Thanks for listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Mike Luke, joined by the boss, Saul Bookman, wearing a very cool Arizona Cardinals gear. Yeah, anything going on with the Cardinals uh, going on, Saul Bookman? We got, we got a little uh, NFL draft party coming up. Uh, it's sold out, though. Details. It, it's sold out at Gila River. Uh, we'll have uh, over 100 people at, at Gila River watching the, the Cardinals show and uh, finding out who is going to be drafted by this oh. beloved team. All right. Now, who would you draft? Are you in the Marvin Harrison Jr. camp? I am in the Marvin Harrison Jr. camp. Uh, or, hey, listen, if you can just drop down a couple spots and you end up with Malik Neighbors and a ton of draft capital, I'm okay with that, too. All right. We got a lot to get to. We're going to talk. Uh, we're going to talk some Big 12 basketball. We are going to talk some Arizona football as well. Expectations for uh, players uh, next year. But first, I get a lot of people asking me this all. So I figured that we would de dedicate an opening to the show about this. What are your expectations going into the Big 12? And I'm going to be honest with you. My expectations are to compete for a championship in the Big 12. I don't go in there and say that, well, you know, they're going to be better. They're going to be better. They're going to be better. Now, again, I'm going to break down some of these teams. But again, I have the expectations that Arizona is going to go in there and compete for, for a championship in the Big 12. Because if you're a top 10 program, those are always your expectations. Are we talking football or basketball? We're talking basketball. We will get to football. Okay, actually, right. actually I think, that, that could have been a Freud. Uh, both of yeah, them. I mean, to be honest with you, yeah. I think both teams should be competing for a championship in the Big 12 next year yes. either way. Um, but yeah, basketball-wise, I mean, that's the goal every year. That, that in, in moving to the Big 12 shouldn't change that. I think – I'm excited for the Big 12 because I think that's going to harden us up much more than the Pac-12 could in recent years. Uh, you know, it's like I said before, it's been a long time since, you know, more than three teams in the conference were like solid, bona fide NCAA tournament, no doubters, right? Uh, right? This year, they got four, but it was kind of a luck of the draw kind of four with Oregon beating Colorado in, a, in the Pac-12 title game and having to beat Arizona just to get there in the first place because nobody expected them to make the tournament. So... Um, I, I, I really do feel like facing teams like Houston, Baylor, Kansas, it's just going to toughen you up. Um, and your style of play is going to be able to adapt as well. Uh, and like, listen, man, you can, you could take nights off in the PAC 12 and still win games. Right. Uh, you have less of those nights off in the big 12 for sure. All right. Now we got a lot of people asking about great Ozabor. I will be talking with somebody later today down at the U of A. We will have some names for you tomorrow. Some actual names where we're not just speculating. All right. Here's what I'm looking at with the big 12. I was talking, I was on some Kansas message boards. Kansas is going to be loaded next year. We're not going to just break down. They, they're, they are expected to return. Well, KJ, uh, KJ Adams is already back. They're starting power forward. Dewan Harris, their starting point guard announced he's back as well. Hunter Dickinson is expected back. They just got uh, Zika Mayo, who, was the uh, like the mid Atlantic player of the year or whatever. He's really good. They got a top five class coming in. They're going to be loaded on paper. They could easily be the preseason number one team in the country. And if they're not, they're going to be right there. Obviously you got Baylor as well. Houston could return all of those players as well. This is, this could be a really, really fun inception to the big 12 Saul Bookman. If you're Houston though, you know, those players, like what else do you have to prove? You know, you've gone to a final four. Most, all those players went to a Final Four. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, yeah, you didn't win a national championship, so maybe that's the only reason why you try to come back. Uh, but they still need a little bit of help, and you saw that in the tournament. Their scoring Agreed. at times can leave a lot to be desired. Right. And so they, they need another bona fide scorer, and can they get that through the portal? I don't know. Can they get that, you know, from recruiting? I don't think so because that team is a hardened team. Like, that right. is a that is a veteran team. Uh, I really like Houston. I really love their program. I like what, what Kelvin Sampson's put together over there unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think they're going to be just as big a, a, of, a, of a tough nugget to crack as, as right. Kansas. In, in Kansas, you know, listen, Kansas is always Kansas. Even when Kansas has a down year, they still get, you know, first, second, third round, no matter right. what. They always make the NCAA tournament. And Bill Self is a good coach. Like, so, I, I listen, man, I, I don't think we're – no doubt favorites in the big 12 because of Kansas and right. because of teams like Houston. Uh, whereas in the, in the pac 12, really for the last, it feels like the last three or four decades, it was either us or it was UCLA. Um, right. And then every now and then you sprinkled in Oregon, but most of the time it was us. Right. And the, the championships have, have proven that over the course of the year. So I think that's a good thing though, Mike, like I, we want competition, bro. We want totally competition. Agree. 
But again, even though we're not the favorite, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be competing for a ch- competing going into that oh, thinking. Yeah. And again, we're going to break down some of this. Uh, we're going to break down some of this here in a second. The other thing too with NIL, and the reason I brought up Houston is, let's say let, Jamal Shed, I think, kind of goes into the uh, a little bit of what Arizona is dealing with. If you're in the era of NIL and you're looked at as like a late second round pick, and you have the possibility of coming back and some, you know, some uh, big booster is going to give you 150k, 200k, we're in a different era now when it comes to that. We're also in a different era in that John Calipari, I thought, or uh, made an interesting point where he said, listen, he said, one thing that I've probably messed up a little bit on is for the next couple of years, this COVID year is still a thing and that you're going to have 23, 24 year old men. And you look in the NCAA tournament and there's a lot of teams that are capitalizing on that. And that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at players. I get people or you know, you look in the portal. I don't care if a kid's 23 years old, if Arizona's looking at him. As a matter of fact, I like that he's 23 years old, Saul. We're not we're not an NBA team. Right. Like I don't care if he's 20, I don't care if he's damn 28. Right. If he's if he's a good player, he's a good player. Right. And you're only gonna get him for a year anyway, especially if they're that old and and you know they're senior. So I'm I'm right there with you, Mike. I think, you know, if if they're 22, 23 years old, but they've had a history of good performances, strong performances, and really development over the years that shows that they're adept, uh, adept to learning and, right. and developing, then I'm cool with that. Like, and I think that's for this particular team and for Tommy Lloyd, he's always going to be going to the portal to try and find some veteran leadership and some good quality players. Uh, Keaton Johnson was, was obviously um, a, a, a great example of that coming from San Diego state an older player. Um, but athletic, could, versatile, could do a bunch of stuff. So that's the type of player that I think Tommy's going to be targeting. And if he can't get that, then you're going to go overseas and try to find some diamonds in, in, in the rough. So right. One thing that's most likely not going to happen, and uh, it's unfortunate, but I understand it. Umar Ballo, I, leader Keenan, I meant Keyshawn. I'm sorry. I don't know why I yeah, said Keyshawn. Well, you know okay. what, man? You got a billion different things going on. I understand. <laughs> but... One thing, Umar Ballo, leader of men, will, it would, barring something very unforeseen, he will not be back. Not that the Arizona coaching staff doesn't want him, but this is a numbers crunch game. The c- staff is huge on Montias Crevis. They're also big on Dylan Anderson. And we can just call it the way it is. If Mount Crevis came, or excuse me, Mount Crevis, if Umar Ballo came back, then you're probably losing those guys. And I think the, the idea for the coaching staff is that they'd rather have multiple years of those players than one more year of Umar Ballo. I get it. I think Lloyd wants stability on his roster going into a uh, big 12 play. And again, as much as I like Umar, we also know exactly what Umar is at this point. He, and that's good. That's not bad, but that is big- good. But you got to talk about this. I think this is the biggest, this is the biggest question you got to ask yourself. Who's going to give you more upside and who can improve the most. Right. And I think that's Crevis because mm-hmm. you're talking about physicality with Crevis. Uh, he needs to work a little bit more on his footwork, um, but his touch has always been solid. Um, you know, he can shoot free throws. Right. Hello. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a big deal. Is that important? Um, hey, Saul, do you know anything about that? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I know what, what I saw in LA and I saw those free throws come up short. That's what I know. Right. But uh, I think, you know, I think Crevis's ability to maybe develop and, and get maybe a little bit of a, a mid range jump shot as well, I think could be the, the versatility you're looking for. That's just never been an option with Balo. It's either at the rim or it's nothing right. uh, with Balo. And so, I, I think when you're talking about development, I think there's more opportunity for Krivis to develop in terms of strength and overall game than there is Balo, and he gives you a little bit more versatility, even though he's not going to show you that this year. So if you point to this year, you're like, well, he didn't do this, this, this. Well, yeah, that's why they make a jump that next right. season. And I don't honestly, the things that Krivis struggled with are things that are correctable. Now, again, he's never going to be a Kim Elijah one. I get that. But here's a couple things that he can do that Umar Ballo could never do. He's got a hook with either side. He's got a hook going either way. He's got the shoulder shake going any way. And people are like, well, you know, he can't finish around the hoop. I put so much of that into the fact that he's just not strong at this point. He yes. needs to get stronger. He needs to get those trunks a little bit more, uh, you know, dealt with. But either way, this is a dude who is, uh, this is a guy that I think next year, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's crazy talk at all to say that he could be 13 and seven. And, and I think that honestly, Saul, I think he's got an upside after that as well. This feels very much like those Gonzaga guys that don't play a ton the first year, second year, become fringe all conference. Then guess what? They become an all American as a junior. We will have this. Where did Tommy Lloyd come from? I don't know. Where'd he come from? I can't remember. <laughs> Gonzaga ever heard of it. Never um, heard of it. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, that's a great point, Mike. Like the development, 
that Gonzaga has had with their bigs has has proven its worth over the the last three decades. Right. And so when you're looking at Krivis, you know Tommy Lloyd's going to take that model and he's going to try and expound on it. And I think that's a great point. I actually think Krivis's upside is more than thirteen seven. I think fifteen and ten is is there Next for year. him if he if he wants it. Yeah. Again, like you're talking about the trunks, right? You got to get those trunks nice and nice and girthy. You got to get ready for that that lower body to be to uh, to take a pounding and. I think he can do it. Absolutely. Strength wise is really the key. If he can get into that weight room all summer long, all off season long, I think you could see a significant jump between now and then similar to what Balo did from Tommy Lloyd's first year, all the way to now, right? You look at how much Balo lost weight, how much in shape he got. Like if you do that, I mean, Chris Rounds is going to take care of my guy, man. Yeah, Chris Rounds will take care of him. Uh, Steve Robinson has asked. Uh, that is a fluid situation. We will know more about uh, Steve Robinson in the next, uh, I would imagine, the next couple of days. No hints on this front, but again, there could be some movement there. Okay, now let's uh, let's talk a little bit then about this incoming uh, this incoming uh, recruiting class. Here's where I think people. People get this a little bit confused, Saul, in that there are the freshmen that come in and they are immediate difference makers. Those are your top three, top four players. Your Mike Bibbies, your DeAndre Aytons, dudes like that that just come in and they're different. If you're a top 15 to 25 kid, you still probably have an NBA future if things go right, but it's going to take a little bit longer. Let's use Carter Bryant, for example. I had a lot of people asking me about Carter Bryant in the McDonald's All-American game. Carter Bryant, to me, is a two-year player. And so a two-year player to me translates generally to somebody that's going to be about 10 and 10 and three, 10 and four as a freshman. And then you make that jump a little bit like a KJ Lewis. That is kind of what I'm looking at. And all these dudes coming in and we'll go one by one. If you're expecting DeAndre Ayton next year, no, you're not going to get that. That's going to be somebody from the transfer portal or somebody like that. 10 and four is nothing. to. And then is, you know, in that second year, then they become a monster, Saul. I, and honestly, like I'm not even looking for anything in the first ten games of the season. Like right. if they give you something cool, uh, but you're looking for something as they develop. KJ, I thought developed over the year, um, really started to learn his role. And I actually thought he he sh- he could take a couple more shots I from agree. the perimeter, um, especially in LA. I thought that he was shooting the ball in practice very very well. And then the first, the only, I think the only three that he took in in that game, he hit. So I think there's there's potential for KJ Lewis's growth and that picture of growth to be copied onto a Carter Bryant, for right. example. Like mm-hmm. I think that that's a, a good picture to move forward with. And yeah, I mean, listen to your point when when you have COVID throw such a monkey wrench into everything and the development of players and the 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 age of players yeah. and the experience of players and the maturity of players becoming a, a significant factor, you're not going to see here in the next two or three years that McDonald's one hit wonder as much as you did before, right. because there's just, there's just too much, too many experienced players out there right now. Now we fast forward to two years, everything's going to throttle back and then you'll see it again, but it's going to be a little bit. Now, Joson Sainon, another one, um, he's he's a little bit different to me in that I think he's probably, he's got a good chance of stepping into that shooting guard position. This is just a guess, but I think you could see him next to KJ Lewis on the perimeter. Sainon to me is, you watch his highlights, and again, I'm not going to pretend like, you know, I've had boots on the ground watching him, but you watch his highlights, and he's somebody that can get, get to the basket. He's already showing up on NBA draft charts. He, to me, is fascinating, but again, a lot of these guys I still think are going to be drafted on potential, Saul. He, I think there's more of a chance of him being a one and done because he's physically more ready. But again, this isn't going to be a Mike Bibby spot. This is probably going to be somebody that could maybe get you 11 points, three, four assists, three, four rebounds. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. I think he would kind of, to me, he he's a hybrid of Michael Dickerson and Richard Jefferson. I'll take it. I feel like those two together – um, some of their skill sets, the way they approach the game, their bounce on the court, the way they moved around the court. I, that's kind of what he reminds me of a little bit mm-hmm. um, because I didn't, I don't feel like he has the quickness of a Michael Dickerson, um, but he does have the explosiveness still, right. just not at that level. And I think he can attack the rim. And I think that's the thing, right? Like I love that Caleb Love was not afraid to take shots in big moments, right? Like I do love that about him. And I know he struggled in the tournament, but I'm still – 
I still revere the kid. I think he's he, he was exactly what Arizona was needed. on the Wooden Award somebody. list. One of the ten best players. Yeah. That's good. He needed Arizona needs somebody that wasn't going to be afraid of these moments. Um, and to his credit, he wasn't. They're going to need somebody next year that's not going to be afraid of these moments. I don't think, I I don't think Jaden Bradley will be the nope. type of player that will be afraid of these moments anymore because I think he stepped up in such a big way in the tournament that. I think he, he, he's got that dog in him now, and he knows that, like, I, I'm that dude. I yeah. can be that dude. And so I'm excited about that, but I still think he needs another tandem teammate at whatever level, whatever position, to be that alternate to him, to also have that dog, much like Khalid and Damon, mm-hmm. uh, Bibby and Simon. Like, everybody needs that, that secondary player that's going to help them out. And so I'm hoping uh, Sainon's going to be that dude. Yeah, then one other player, and this is when you have an abundance of riches, a top 30 player that not a lot of people are talking about, Jamari Phillips, that has been playing in your neck of the woods up there in Phoenix. Um, Jamari Phillips' dad, big fan of the show. We're a big fan of him as well. Um, Listen, uh, the only thing with Jamari is I think he can score at all three levels. I'm bigger on on him, or I'm bigger with him than I think some scouts are. I think he's going to be a multi-year player, but he's another one. He's got a little bit of a dog to him. And uh, again, you need dudes that can score. And especially when you're a three level scorer from three mid range and get into the a bucket, you can always use dudes like that. Um, I don't know quite what to expect from him, but I still think that he's going to be a very valuable piece. It might, maybe not quite a starter this year, but down the road, another one, Saul, when you're Arizona and you get a top 30 player and he's kind of forgotten about, that's a good thing. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. How many times have we forgotten about top 30 players that have come into the program and we've seen them excel over the years? Right. Uh, Jason Terry came in and nobody really thought much about him, especially after his first year. And then all of a sudden, you know, by the time he's a senior, he's a he's an All-American player of the year and he's in the ring of honor. Right. right. And so that's what you're hoping for with, with some of these kids. I'm not really familiar with Jamari's game as much as you are. Um, I, I haven't had an opportunity to go down the street and watch him play you know, uh, especially being up here in Phoenix, I'm interested to see, you know, I've seen the highlights and I've seen a couple little clips in terms of gameplay, but I'm not sure what to expect from him either. And so I'm kind of in the same boat as you. Again, Tommy is such a good developer of talent. Yeah. And I think that's the thing you got to hang your hat on. It's different because Luke to me was also a great developer of talent. Sean, to me, was not as much a great developer of talent as he was trying to fit you into his scheme. And there's two big differences there. Trying to develop skills for an individual player to get them to play in an elite level, regardless of scheme, is kind of what I think Tommy Lloyd is all about. Whereas Sean Miller was trying to develop you to run the fucking pack line defense, and that's it, right? right. And so that's that's there's there's a big difference there and when you when you train people to fit your system you're not necessarily training them to develop over the years to become the best version of themselves which ultimately hurts your program and the reason why you see the inconsistency sometimes in the Sean Miller era in terms of getting to elite 8 and then not making it to the tournament or making it to the tournament and so on and so forth so i think Tommy Lloyd's got that in his bag and I, i'm very confident in what he could do in terms of development with his team I- I am as well. Emmanuel Steven, um, I expect him to redshirt or not play a ton this year. He Arizona's got big men they redshirted this year that I expect uh, to play. He will be very good. And I do love, I love Jamari Phillips. All right, Nicholas Ibarra. I like Nicholas Ibarra, but he's beating me up a lot here. I love Jamari Phillips. You could, again, tweet at his dad and ask who the biggest fan of his son's game is. And <laughs> he will definitely answer that it's me. I'm just, listen, man, sometimes you get a little bit more information. You You talk with a few people that say, we really like the, you know, theoretically we really like the guy we think he's going to be really good but you know there are some players that he's going to have to beat out i'm just passing that along man i like that's that's every school though that's every school it doesn't matter if you're the number one recruit listen if you think cooper flag is going to step onto duke's campus and he's going to start day one just off of rep you're out of your mind he's going to have to prove it too and you saw him the other night. He didn't have the greatest game in the McDonald's All-American game. I actually – there was a couple things about his game that I was just like – that was the first full game that I was able to watch him play. Right. And eh, – eh, He's you know? good, but it's not like he – I didn't – you know what it's all – I didn't come away thinking that that was a generational talent. Yes. That's yes. The best I can put exactly. It. Exactly that. You know, now would I feel a little skewed if he was an Arizona prospect and coming in? Maybe a little bit, but – I, I look at I try to look at players for what they can bring to the to the team and what what kind of development you can see in their path. 
And and Cooper's going to be a good player. Don't get me wrong. I just didn't feel like he was, you know, he, he didn't meet the hype that was coming into it. And I don't know if that means he's going to be a surefire starter day one at Duke. He's going to have to prove it, just like all these guys have to prove it. Even Mike Bibby, when he got onto campus, he had to prove it. Now, mm-hmm. did he prove it in practice number one? Probably. But you still have to prove it. You can't just show up off a of rep only and be like, yeah, I'm going to start day one. That's just not how it works. You know, Saul, one thing that we don't have to prove, though, is the Arizona lottery. That speaks for itself. You would agree. Absolutely. Now, listen, you said you've been humble and you said you've never won the Arizona lottery, though. Is this true? I, have, I won four bucks one time. Well, you lied to me then, Saul. You said you've never won the Arizona lottery. Come on, Saul. You're better than that. We caught you red-handed. Either way, just like Saul Bookman, the Arizona lottery is not just about playing games and winning prizes. It's about giving back to the state and its community. Visit azadventure.com for more information on how you can take an adventure for a chance to win $1 million in cash and Arizona travel prizes. And, oh, geez, Saul Fill us in on OGs and what's going on up there in the Valley because OGs is taking care of business down here as well. Absolutely. OGs, the best edible in the game. Their sleepy time gummy is fantastic. Mike, do you have trouble sleeping at night sometimes? No. No? No, but I still like Um, OGs. Well, you know what? I had trouble sleeping last Thursday night after the game, and I popped a little OGs, and I slept like a baby until about 4 o'clock in the morning when we had to go to the airport. So OGs, the best edible in game. Go to OGsBrands.com. Check out their website. It'll show you where the closest dispensary is to you. Tucson's very own OGs, by the way, made and produced in Tucson, by the way. Uh, And, uh, yeah, go check out the, the delicious edibles that they have, the indicas, the sativas. Uh, they have happy balance gummies, the RSOs. Uh, listen, they they know what they're doing over there. It's a it's a family business. They they grew it from scratch, uh, and you should also check them out because it is a Tucson product. So support your local uh, product by going to ogsbrands.com. And remember, Mike, you must what? be twenty one years age uh, twenty one years of age or older to enjoy. All is the disclaimer down, and yes, we will be getting to some uh, Arizona football talk because I have some uh, I have some very uh, very pointed p- opinions here. Pointed, no, yeah, all right, um, okay. Now, here's where I'm at to it because it does look like Kylan Boswell is back. We we're talking about this at least for right now. Could change, but it does look like Kylan Boswell is back. Here's where that's good. That's yes, good. I'm here's all I need. Here's what I here's what I need with here's what I need from Boswell. I just need, I need this to be, I need last year to be a learning experience. That's it. Cause again, you're 18 years old. I get all of that. We've been, we've been over that. The kid obviously has talent. Now, again, I would roll with Jaden Bradley at the point. I love Jaden Bradley, but if Boswell comes back, works his butt off and the coaching staff wants him back and he works hard, then I'm cool with it. I just need last year to be a learning experience. That's all. How, how tall was Khalid Reeves? Six, three, six, two. How tall was uh, Damon Stoudemire? A five ten. How tall was Mike Bibby? Not six one. How tall was Miles Simon? Not six four. So why can't we have two guys of a similar stature playing in the backcourt at the same time? Yeah, they just got to be good. That's it. I don't care about height and bat. I don't care about perimeter height. There's two things in college basketball I don't care about. I don't care about perimeter height. I think it's drastically overrated. And when people say that you need shooters, yes, you need shooters, but I need bucket getters more so than I need shooters in college. This is not the pros where you have to have that kind of, let me look at Jaden Bradley, for example, not a great shooter. Guess what? Even when Clemson played off of him, he lived at the free throw line. So again, I need bucket getters. But again, if you're, I don't really, and that goes back to the other thing. I don't care about height on the perimeter, to be honest with you. I think that's kind of overrated. I need players that can play, period. You need aggressive players. Yes. You need aggression. And that's the thing about, that's the thing about Jaden Bradley that stood out to me. You know, listen, this is the first time I was that close to be able to watch this team play on Thursday. And the thing that stood out the most was, Jaden Bradley's relentless attack to the rim. He did mm-hmm. not stop. And Jade and, and Kylan, I don't think he he even got into the paint more than once. The well, that is the game. issue. He shot that solid, is the he, problem. He shot one free throw per game this year. That's just not good that's enough. Terrible. That's not that's not good enough at all. He's got to be much much better. So I, I would say, uh, you know, if Kylan's going to learn anything from this year, it is you've got to you've got to work on your all-around game, especially in the paint and getting to the basket. Because I think from time to time, you can live with the shots from the perimeter if he's also balancing that out with the attack to the rim. But the problem is is that he was 
too perimeter reliant and too mid range reliant, and he didn't really do much uh, of anything else. So I want to see him develop those skills so that way he can be a better all around player and really complement what Jaden Bradley is going to do on the other end. And so right. if they can do that, those two could be the best backcourt in the country. But if he doesn't do that, it'll be Jaden Bradley and that other guy. Right. What I need also is I need, like I said, I need aggression more so than anything, because if you come out and you're aggressive again, Bradley was living at the free throw line. It slows the game down. And here's the other thing. People say, well, you know, we need shooters. Yes, in theory, you need shooters. But let's give you an example. Pella Larson shot 42% from three this year. Pella is Pella is a very good player. My bad, Pella. Hashtag movement. We all know this. But he is also not a some. Uh, he was not a shooter anybody was scared of. Clemson was be begging him to shoot threes. Clemson was not going to ever beg. We've seen great shooters here. We've seen Salim Stoudemire. Pella's not shooting you out of a zone, Saul. I, I agree, but there's a big reason why Pella was not as effective uh, shooting and was not nearly the threat to Clemson as he could have been. And the reason why is because he has a slow release on his jump mm -hmm. shot. Very slow. He has to be very set in order to get that, that shot off. He's not really a, 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 a come-off-the-screen, catch-and-shoot kind of guy. He has to be set. And when, you, when you're a set shooter, you give, the t you give the defense just an extra second to be able to recover and sometimes that's all they need. And that's what Clemson really tried to force Pella to do. They were like, hey, he can shoot the three because we know we can get a hand up in his face before he gets the shot off. And so if you get a, a player that could come off screens, catch and shoot, you know, look at the kid from Oakland. I forget what his name is. I, I'm not saying I want that yeah. kid, but that kid, I mean, hell, as soon as he caught it, it didn't matter if he was on balance or not. He's chucking right. it up, right. you know, and, and he's hitting 10 threes a game. So you need a, a, a high volume shooter and when I say high volume, I don't mean the amount of shots. I mean, like, uh, the the method into getting into his shot, right? So coming off screens, catching and shooting quickly, like, you got to have those skills. Otherwise, you, you know you're what just it, a liability. And this is why I don't really see Pella in the NBA. I, again, I could be wrong. I've been wrong many, many times. I'll be wrong again. Pella's not the dude that can, like, come off screens because, again, when he comes off screen, you have to have a quick release. And you know the other thing, too? He's got kind of a – he doesn't take advantage of his height when he shoots his shot. And that a lot of that is because of his set shot. It's kind of a TJ McConnell-type set shot to a certain degree. You look at Ray Allen. Ray Allen got as high up as he could on that shot. So again, he wasn't shooting it as a man who was six foot five. He was shooting it more as a man who was six foot nine. When Pello, wow, yeah, Pe I guess Saul didn't like I don't that. Know what happened? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know what I happened Saul there. I don't. Right. I don't know what happened there. Sorry, right, so I'll never do that again. Um, but uh, <laughs> but when Pella shoots the ball, Pella's shooting it more as a dude who's like about six foot two, as opposed to being six five with the kind of athleticism that he has. He doesn't take advantage of that enough for me. That's, uh, I guess, that is more of an. So I guess we're kind of on the same page as that. So. Well, not only that, but like when you're talking about guys like Ray Allen, you're talking about footwork fundamentals that are yeah. at, at a top notch level. When he was at UConn, his his coming off the the screen game and curling off off of the the bottom screen was second to none. Like he was just. It, I mean, one of the beautiful, the most beautiful shots in the game. He rip Hamilton, seen. and it's funny they were both same after thing. each other. Same thing. Same thing. You know, coming off those screens, catching, shooting, having those fundamentals down. Like Pella just isn't that guy. And I agree with you. I, I'm not. I'm not a big believer in Pella's ability to play at the next level. Um, I think he's going to take a couple years to play in the G League in order to develop and get onto an NBA roster. Um, I'm typically spot on with U of A prospects. I think that they're you know, I wasn't wrong about Raleigh. I wasn't wrong about Trier. I wasn't wrong about any of the other guys that came out. I didn't think Dusan was going to get drafted. He didn't. Um, and there's a bunch of guys that, that come through this program that I thought if they develop, they could get there. But there's there's one weakness in their game. You, Pell is the jack of all trades, the master of none. Would right. you agree? Yeah, for sure. And, and, and you can't thrive in the NBA if you're that guy. You right, just can't. Sure. You have to have one discernible trait that an NBA team can point to and be like, if we don't have anything else, at least we know we have that. Right. And again, he's a, he's a good defender. He's not a great defender. That's the thing. Like when Richard Jefferson was here and Jason Richardson couldn't get a shot off against him in the final four against Michigan state, you knew like, again, and this is with, that's with all due respect. Not everybody's an NBA player. I think people, 
I think people think that, you know, you're somehow dissing them when you say you saw you cover the NBA. You're up front there every single people do not realize how good NBA players are, just how also, insanely gifted they are. Also, why is it disrespectful if I say this guy should be playing in Europe and right. making millions of dollars? You know, go ask Corey Williams how many players uh, from the U of A history uh, opted to try and make it in the NBA and struggled and struggled and they ended up playing in the CBA making, you know, minimal dollars when they could have been overseas like him making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like right. that's, that's a perfect example. And I think you, to your point earlier too, like when you're talking about a kid like Balo, if it, let's just say Crevis wasn't around and, and you needed a big to stay around, you know, if you're Balo, you stay because you're going to make more money right now in college than you would playing in the G league. You right. just will. So I, I think, I think your point stands about that. And I think that when you're looking at this roster, and you're looking at what's leaving versus what's coming in. There's nothing wrong with not being an NBA talent. Um, it's just, you know, the premier players play in the NBA. And if you're not, it, and if you're not at that level, I'll give you There's an idea. Wrong with that? One of the best players I've ever seen come out of Tucson, Terrell Stoglin. He went to uh, went to Maryland. He led the ACC in scoring as a sophomore. He put up forty on uh, Duke. He couldn't make the NBA. Not only could he not make the NBA, he couldn't really get a sniff. He got a, into a training camp. This dude was awesome. He would light up almost anybody that anybody knows. It's just a different game, man. It's just people I, don't get this. I don't get upset when we, you know, I didn't make Division One. I. I ended up going Division Two, like you know. And if somebody was like, "Well, you weren't a Division One athlete," I don't give a shit. Like, okay, right. I still played in college. I don't care. Guess guess who didn't play Division One basketball as well? Saul Bookman, Mike Luke. How'd you know? You knew that. You yeah. knew that. I do have a question, and then, then we got to get to a little bit of football here because I did promise this. Your free throw record. I have been meaning to ask this question. Okay. Did you miss? Did you end up missing a free throw, or was that? Did you just when when you hit your fifty or whatever? Did was that? Is that basically your last? Was your last shot to make? No. So yeah. So this is what happened. We're playing McClintock uh, in uh, the regional in the state playoffs. And uh, at the time, their head coach, Derek Wheaton, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, what's his name, Javon uh, Penley, uh, all got technicals all at the same time. So three technicals, and I got fouled on, a, on an and one. So I had to go to the free throw line and shoot seven free throws. <laughs> And so I made the first six and I missed the seventh and that was 43. Oh, all right. All right. I've actually been meaning to ask you and I keep forgetting about that. Good to know. Knowledge is power in these spots. You know what else is knowledge is power, Saul? Game time. Let's say that you're not like Saul Bookman and you can't just go to the Suns games willy nilly hang around with Gerald and all the cool kids. Game time is here for you. It is for the people by the people. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code PHNX for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code PHNX $20 off. By the way, Saul, these things are not just good for athletic events. I've had multiple people tell me that they've used them for concerts as well. Oh, yeah. Game time is where it's at. All right. Now let's get to a little bit of Arizona football. All right. So I had to miss a couple practices because we're off covering the NCAA tournament. Grr. But Saul, I'm going to say this. There is no reason that Arizona football should not have one of the best offenses in college football, period. I know you got a new staff. I know you've got a, you know, uh, you got a new OC. I get all of that. Here's what you still got. You've got Noah Fafita. You have got a plethora of wide receivers. You've got a loaded offensive line, a loaded running backs unit. There's really no reason this shouldn't be one of the best offenses in college football, and it should be all season. So... Last year, we got a little frustrated because of Jaden Delora and how much Fish was just dedicated to, to that guy, right? Mm -hmm. um, I also had a frustration the first two years under Fish about one particular player that I just feel like is on the cusp of going absolutely ape you-know-what, and that's Speedy Luke. Fam. Dude, I just think... I think they're good. They're going to find a way to utilize him far more than the last regime did. And I'm, I'm excited for that. And I think that, that he could be one of the biggest difference makers on this team heading into next season, because his speed is second to none. Um, he's getting better and better at carrying the ball, catching the ball out of the backfield. I think they'll put him in the slot from time to time. Like his versatility knows no bounds. 
And so when you're looking at the totality of this team and you're looking at guys that can complement what Fafita and T-Mac can bring to the table, he's one of those guys. Right. So I'm excited about this team because I do think that they have a lot of versatility all over the place. And, you know, I know those the, the two stars are going to get all the limelight and they're going to get all the shine. But there's so many other valuable skill players on this team that that are that are going to get their opportunity to really showcase how much of an NFL talent that they are. And this team has a lot of NFL talent. That's something that's been void of for like 10, 15 years. A Mike. long time. Oh, my I mean, goodness. Just look at the NFL draft coming up. You've got a guy in uh, Jordan Morgan. Could be a first round pick. Jacob Cowing is going to go in the top three. Tanner McLaughlin is going to go in the top four round. It is going to be very odd. I mean, heck, it's going to be very odd even when the Cardinals are looking, saying, man, there might be guys from Arizona on their big board. It's just, it's been a long time, and uh, we got to give that, uh, got to give them a lot of credit. I am big on FAM, though, as well. Uh, as Pops, if he's in here, uh, Raymond, as you know, we're big on you. But also, FAM is a dude who is about, uh, first of all, he came in at about 5'8", uh, one, probably about 160, my uh, my playing weight. But he's not at my playing weight anymore. He's about... Is he about 210 now? No, not no, not that. He'll never be that big. But he's about a solid 185. So he's put on about 20 plus pounds of muscle. But he's solid now. But he looks big, though. I was surprised when his dad told me that he was only like, you know, what he was. Um, and I might be getting the number wrong by a few, but yeah, I mean, that just goes to maturation. Also, here's what I, I, and I've been saying this all year. Here's what I need. 10 touches per game. I don't care how they happen. I don't care how they happen in the return game. I don't care if they happen at the receiver position, running back, you name it. I need 10 touches per game from fam. If you get 10 touches per game, I think that really stresses a defense. Absolutely. I think that's a great, that's a great number for, for speedy Luke, because Listen, you you need him to get touches this year. This is the year that he deserves to get some recognition. Deserves it. He deserves because because he's been putting in the time. He's been dedicated to the program. He could have easily transferred out last year. Mm -hmm. You know, he could have easily transferred out this year. Right. I think he's going to get a bona fide opportunity to, to really prove himself. Um, you know, you heard him in the press conference the other day talking about you know how optimistic, um, you know how optimistic he is for the season, how excited he is for the season, and on um, the type of things that they're trying to put into the system. Uh, to really take advantage of his skill sets. I'm excited for this season. I know everybody's excited about it. But one of the things that I think I'm more excited about is the fact that we're playing in a league that is going to be very offensively dominant. Mm -hmm. And and Arizona is going to have one of the better defenses in said league. That's why I have so much optimism about where they're going to fall, uh, you know, in the in the in the pecking order of the Big 12. And to me, they're right there at the top. So yeah, we're going to talk a lot about the uh, defense uh, tomorrow as well. But again, and that's the other thing too, going into the big, big 12 people, people are making this out. Like this is like the mid American conference or something. These are teams in here. You're going to have four or five preseason top 25 teams. We know this already. Listen, and again, who? I get very, I get very, uh, who in the big 12. Yeah. Who, who's going to be top 25 Oklahoma state for sure. Kansas state for sure. Arizona for sure, Utah for sure. There's four right there off the top of my head. I think that's it. All right. Well, either way, four. I said four <laughs> or five, Saul. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, my bad. My bad. My hey, bad. you know who's not on there? You're I just D1. wanted you. I just wanted to prove that you knew what you're talking about. That's all. Well, I just said I named four off the top of my head. You know Damn. who's not on there? Your Deion Sanders led Colorado Buffaloes, Saul Bookman. <laughs> you love throwing that in my face, Kansas. Uh, Kansas. That's oh, right, Dennis Walsh. Kansas. 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 Five, five, yeah. five. Listen, I'm a big prime fan. There's nothing wrong with that. I hate Colorado. I hate Colorado, but I love Dion. So you'd rather have Shadur uh, than Noah. That's blasphemy. I no, that's bullshit, Mike. That's not what I said. You know that. You're trying to trigger me. I said Shadur is a better pro prospect than Noah. But Noah's a better college athlete and player for the system that he's playing than Shadur. A million percent. I have no argument about that. Well, I will take that. That was just also like the tweet that you say you didn't put out there about Mikhail Bridges that I found. Yeah, that was a bad tweet. My bad. <laughs> but you know what? You're the boss. You can do that kind of stuff. Very excited. But again, I like Big 12 football. We're also going to a, a Kansas State game. This is correct. Oh, yeah. A million percent. Listen, Mike, we are going to go to Aggieville. That's what they call it down there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, listen, it's going to be lit. It's going to be fun. We're going to fly into Kansas City, Mike. We're going to eat some barbecue. We're going to rent a car. We're going to drive to Manhattan. 
We're going to hang out there for a day. We're going to hang out at tailgate. I already got a tailgate for us to go hang out at. And then we're going to go cover the game and do our postgame show uh, somewhere around that uh, salt t- zone. I've been trying to tell our Pac-12 buddies, well, obviously a lot of Pac-12 buddies, Kansas City is a cool spot. Salt, yeah, you, can, you, can, you, uh, can you vouch for Kansas City, yeah. please? Kansas City is one of my favorite cities. Um, right. And if I know it, the only thing I don't like about the fact that we have to go to Kansas City for the for the Big 12 basketball tournament is because it's so close to Kansas. It's right. no different than if U of A got a home game up here in, in Phoenix. Right. You know what I mean? That's just not fair when you're talking. And, that, and it's literally that close. Right. It's not very far. It's like 40 miles away. So Kansas and Kansas State have uh, a significant advantage in terms of travel. But – Outside of that, Kansas City is a phenomenal city. You will not go wrong in terms of that that city. That it's it's one of my favorite cities out in the in the country. By the way, Jacob Franklin, working behind the scenes, messaged me and says Kansas with a uh, exclamation point and a question mark. They'll be ranked. Thank you, Jacob Franklin, for stealing that off of the Dennis Walsh comments in yeah. the thread. You get no credit from that, Jacob Franklin. Zero. Zero credit from the great Jacob Franklin. Now, but you know what? What does get credit? The BetMGM Sportsbook app. Saul Bookman, listen, yeah. when you're watching, there's all kinds of stuff right now. I, I tell people this all the time. Base, baseball outside of the Diamondbacks bores me senseless, but I am happy for Jacob Franklin because he does like the Diamondbacks. And the Diamondbacks, great coverage from Derek and Jesse and Jacob. By the way, that's when I know that Jacob's full of it. I see Jacob on all kinds of shows, but he won't come on here. Jacob Franklin, we don't like that. Listen, but- Mike. I, I will not stand for the Jacob Franklin slander, one, because he doesn't need to be here. We He's like an ASU Frank- guy. No, but we like Jacob Franklin. Yeah, we like Jacob Franklin. We also like him behind the Mac and not on our show. This is a U of A podcast, not ASU. He knows his lane. That's the great thing about, about Jacob. He is the premier role player. He knows his role. Is Jacob the tallest role player in world history? A million percent. A yes. million percent. All right, but like Jacob Franklin, the BetMGM Sportsbook also serves a role. This is true. Here's the deal. Use bonus code PHNX. Place your first BetMGM Sportsbook wager through the BetMGM Sportsbook mobile app for at least $10, and you'll receive $1,500 in bonus bets if the bet loses. Check out the show notes for details. Let's hear from the great Shane Diefenbach with the disclaimer. Bets expire in seven days. One new customer offer only. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Available in the U.S. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY-467-369, New York. Call 1-800-327-5050, Massachusetts. 21 plus only. Please gamble responsibly. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP, Arizona. 1-800-BETS-OFF, Iowa. 1-800-981-0023, Puerto Rico. First bet offer for new customers only. Subject to eligibility requirements. Bonus bets are non-withdrawable. In partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. See BetMGM.com for terms. U.S. promotional offers not available in New York, Nevada, North Carolina, Ontario, or Puerto Rico. All right, Saul, here's where I'm at, though, with Arizona Athletics, and I keep telling people this. This is the, the way that I like to end this show. Arizona basketball. Top 10 program, Arizona football going to be ranked, going to be very good. This is a great time to be an Arizona Wildcats fan. We've been through a lot of crap. We deserve this. We have been through a lot of crap. And uh, you should come join the rest of the diehards that are here in the Discord uh, at every opportunity. Listen, we got, we're got we trying to grow this thing, and we need people to join our diehard community so we can keep growing this thing and do cool events out there in the spaces. So uh, become a diehard. Also. I wanted to ask you a question. Andy Bryant uh, said, are you meeting Fitz and John Kutz when at the K-State game? I don't know who Fitz is, but Kurt, uh, John Kutz, yes, I'm meeting him. Uh, he's my homie, man. We, we go way he back. Um, so, yeah, John Kurtz, he's, he's phenomenal. I actually uh, uh, came across a person named Whitney Hartman, who's a K-State alum, and she she's a big, big-time big fan, and uh, she actually invited us to, to her tailgate. So that's who we're going to swing by and check out. We'll be pressing the flesh, kissing the babies, doing all the stuff that we're going to do there. I'm a married man, Mike. Ah, well, that's true. Good point. But on that note, for the great Saul Bookman, by the way, Saul, the Mike Bibby thing, talk about it. Talk about it. Oh, yeah, guys. Dude, this is awesome. It starts tomorrow. Uh, We have a Suns watch party tomorrow and on Sunday. Uh, But besides that, uh, if you want to come out and just watch the, the final four games on Saturday and on Monday, uh, come out. Mike Bibby will be here at Gila River at Wild Horse Pass. Uh, you can see his entire shoe collection. You can meet him, uh, take pictures, sign autographs, the whole nine yards. It's a phenomenal event. Are you going to take Mike, a picture with him? And Mike, it is free. It is absolutely free. You don't have to pay a single dime. You just come in, get to tour the space, hang out with us, have a good time. 
Uh, if you come on Saturday, you'll not only meet Mike Bibby, but you'll also meet a couple of Suns players, Ish Wainwright and Royce O'Neal. I mean, what's not to love? You get to meet Mike Bibby. He's a, can, he's a dope can dude. We, can we guarantee a Saul Bookman picture will be published with Mike Bibby? Uh, oh, yeah. A million percent. I, I haven't seen Mike for 30 years. I got to play against him one time. That's the only time I got to play against him. And uh, I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to it, man. All right. As always, appreciate all of you guys. You guys are the ones that make all of this happen. Nicholas Ibarra, you're my guy. Be nice to me next uh, show. This was very mean on your part, but I will. Uh, I probably deserved it. Go ahead. Also, uh, new new PS Diego, new PS Diego said event at a CU game. Uh, so again, like if if we get enough diehards in the system, then yeah, we could do things on the road at CU. Uh, we could do things at home against, you know, other teams, like whatever we want to do. Listen, the world is your oyster. You just got to be a part of our oyster. Yep, that's it. And we're pr we're privileged enough to be part of the Saul Bookman oyster. But on that <laughs> note, <laughs> for Saul Bookman and his oyster, Jacob Franklin behind the scenes doing good work, copying Dennis Walsh and then claiming it was his own. Nice try, what Jacob fraud. Franklin. I am merely Mike Luke. We'll be back with you tomorrow. You've been listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast. We all silly like the mayor. 